Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. Again, we are on the My Thought series. And uh, today I thought I would talk about the elephant in the room, the coronavirus. Somehow, in some way, this virus is affecting everyone in the world at the same time. Not just physically, impacting our health, but also our financial and mental stability. We are now surrounded by fear and uncertainty. There are so many questions as to what does the future hold, not just for us individually, but for the whole world in general. So how are we supposed to perceive this pandemic that we are experiencing? One thing for sure, fear and panic are not the answer. They never are. I read an article by a Gutrick Gill entitled, What If?, that I found interesting and has a positive approach to what we all see as, a neg as negative and challenging. So here's what he posted. He says, there is so much fear, and perhaps rightfully so, about the COVID-19. And what if, if we subscribe to the philosophy that life is always working out for us, that there is an intelligence far greater than humans at work, that all is interconnected. What if the virus is here to help us, to reset, to remember what is truly important? Reconnecting with family and community, reducing travel so that the environment, the skies, the air, our lungs, all get a break. Parts of China are seeing blue skies and clouds for the first time in forever with the factories that shut down. Working from home rather than commuting to work. Less pollution, more personal time. Reconnecting with family as there is more time at home. An invitation, so to speak, to turn inwards. A deep meditation rather than the usual extroverted going into self-soothe to reconnect with self, what is really more important to me. A reset economically, the working poor, the lack of health care access for over 30 million people in the United States, the need, so to speak, for paid sick leave. And really, how hard does one need to work to be able to live, to have a life outside of work and washing our hands? How did that become a new thing that we needed to remember? But yes, we did. The presence of grace for all. There is a shift underway in our society. What if it is one that is favorable in the long run for all of us? What if this virus is an ally in our personal and national evolution? In our remembrance of what it means to be connected, humane, living a simpler life, to be impactful, more kind to our environment. An offering from my heart this morning offered as another perspective, another way of looking to this virus, this unfolding, this evolution. It was time for a change. We all knew that. And change has arrived. What if? You know, death and sickness are really a part of life. It's a sad reality, but most of us find our connection to God and spirituality through pain and suffering, not joy and happiness. There is a reason that our forefathers asked God, Abraham for old age, Yitzhak Isaac for sickness, and Yaakov for a deathbed experience. We forgot to connect God to the positives and light, the joy and the laughter. Most often when that happens, we take credit for that ourselves. When things seem difficult, then we ask, why? Why God has treated us so badly? Or where is God? We need to know and acknowledge that nothing, I repeat, nothing in life is an accident. Everything in life has a positive purpose. We just need to be patient and let nature take its course. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be proactive. After all, our sages tell us, ain't some kemalanes. One should not rely upon miracles. We need to do all that is within our power. But in the end, 
In the end, everything will turn out just as God has programmed it to be. There's a saying that says, in the end, everything will be good. And if it's not good, then it's not the end. This pandemic has also helped us to remember the importance of the number one. The world has become a neighborhood. One person, one person can spread the virus to hundreds, if not thousands of people. At the same time, one person, excuse me, one person has the ability to save the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people through research and technology. On a smaller scale, we may be able to protect those who are most vulnerable by following the proper hygienic guidelines and social interactions. We can look in on elderly family members and neighbors to see if, we have, if they have some needs that we can help them with. Remember, the world was created for just one person. So if you save one person, you have saved the world. In the book of Shemot, in the portion of Kisisa, 3.33.20, Moshe asks God, please let me have a vision of your glory. And God answers Moshe with the words, Lo yirani ha'adam v'chai. A man cannot have a vision of me and still exist, still live. God does, though, allow Moshe to see his backside, as the verse continues. Bara'isa es acharai upanai lo yeru that you'll be able to see my backside, but my face you will not be able to see. How do we understand that statement? There's a um, story that's told about the Qasam Sofer. In the year 1809, there's a war that broke out between France and Austria. And the city of Pressburg fell under siege. And in the course of the war, the Hassam Sofer suffered great troubles from which he was saved by a great miracle. Now, several of Pressburg's Jews risked their lives to buy weapons from neighboring villagers who would strip the bodies of dead soldiers after a battle. They, in turn, and they would, uh, they in turn would, they were living under French rule. And what the uh, peasants would do is they would sell the uh, weapons and uh, these weapons would be sold to the Austrian um, emperor, to the government. Now, one day as the profits from these sales are being divided among Jews who were buying them from the peasants, a quarrel broke, broke out among the men. And it reached a difficult place. And they decided to convey, convey, con convene pardon me, a din Torah, take it to the Jewish court. And the case was judged, and the winning party decided to record the verdict in the city archives. Now, that was a problem. This brought the matter to the attention of the non-Jewish judges who realized the case dealt with serious and illegal offenses of selling weapons to the enemy. They informed the city's French authorities at once. The French military court placed the blame and the entire affair on the chief rabbi soldier, so shoulders, pardon me, as he was the one who had the power under the authority of the Basin, the Jewish court. So the Hassam Sofer, the head of the court, was accused of spying and aiding the enemy in wartime. He was to stand trial in a military court, a capital offense. Fear and dread descended upon the Pressburg Jewish community and upon the Hassam Sofer himself, who was quite worried. He explored ways to escape the city but the community leaders believed that he would be better off served to stand trial. And they believed that God Almighty would liberate him from his troubles, unharmed. In addition, they collected a large sum of money just on a maybe. On the day it was appointed for the trial, the Hassam Sofer was led into the courtroom. And the moment he stepped into the court, a terrible fear enveloped him. The sight of the military judges filled him with dread. They sat in a half circle in full military dress with stern faces and drawn swords. The chief judge, though, a French general, hastened to calm the Hassam Sofer's fears and urged him, don't be afraid. The drawn swords were only there as a custom, he explained, intended to intimidate defendants. 
The general commanded the others to replace their swords in their sheaves. He waited for a few moments till the Hassam Sofer had composed himself and then opened the trial. Now after hearing the chief rabbi's intelligent and articulate arguments, the trial was quickly decided in his favor. Afterwards, the general and the Hassam Sofer met alone in, the ro in a room for a long time. And the ones, other people were wondering what took so long. Why was he sequestered with the chief judge? Later, the Hassam Sofer explained. Years before, when he was learning as a bacher, as a young boy in Minsk, the Hassam Sofer had stayed in the home of a prosperous family who cared for all his needs. When Napoleon's armies conquered the city, a number of soldiers took up residence in the rich man's home. One of them was a young and talented officer. He became very close to the young Moshe, the Hassam Sofer, and offered to teach him various things in return for the boy's help. So the Hassam Sofer became his informal aide, cleaning his uniform and ta tasks such like that. Over the years, the young officer rose to the rank of general. And it was he, the Hassam Sofer explained, who was the chief judge in the case against him. The general, recognizing the defendant at once as the boy he had liked in Minsk, worked for his acquittal. Then joyously, he had revealed his identity to the Hassam Sofer. After this, self, after this episode, the Hassam Sofer would explain the Pusik that I mentioned, and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen, in a totally different light. We often see things being done without understanding why God Almighty had made things happen this way. But after a long time, however, we see and understand clearly that these things were not in vain. Rather, they were preparation for our salvation and rescue. And so the words, and you'll see my back, tell us that we will understand the purpose behind various events that happened in the past. The words of my face may not be seen teach us that what is in front in the future cannot be seen or understood. There is no better example of this simple truth than the friendship of a young French officer and the boy who would become the Hassam Sofer. So we see that we really don't understand why things happen. But we do have a belief, a strong belief and an understanding of the Gamzu, that everything will be for the best. We just need to let things play out. We say in the daily in the Shema the words, Vishinanta Levanecha Vadibarta Bum. And you shall teach them to your children, you shall speak in them. The verse in the Shema tells us to give our children a Torah education. And then there will be what we call no generation gap. You will both be able to speak bum in them, bum meaning the Torah. As we see the first letter in the Torah, the Bays represents the first letter of the written Torah. And the Lamed, the last letter of the written Torah. So, the eight, so that an 80-year-old grandfather and his 5-year-old grandchild are able to interact with each other since they are both learning the same book. Now the word bum in them also has a numerical value of 42. This is very important. Why? The Holy Baal Shem Tov taught us that the Jews in the desert had 42 journeys. So too all of us in our lifetimes will experience 42 major events. It is those special times, times when we are challenged, times when we are pushed to the limits that we didn't even know existed times when we felt like giving up, but we didn't. We succeeded. These are our greatest moments, our true achievements. These are the moments that we talk to our children about, bum, in them, and hope that they are able to learn from our challenges and our successes. The Talmud in Sanhedrin states that the period immediately prior to the advent of the Messiah will be one of great travail and turmoil. There will be world recession, and governments will be ruled by despots. It is in this troubling setting that the Messiah will arrive. This pandemic will end, but hopefully will teach us lessons that we will not forget. Think of others, not just yourself. And with that idea of avas chinam, of baseless love, may we merit to usher in the coming of Mashiach quickly.
and in our time. May God bless you and your families, and may all of us stay healthy. Thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom.